Welcome back to The Deep Dive. I'm really glad you're joining us today. We're going to unpack what was, well, an incredibly active month in the global fight against HIV. Yeah, August 2025 really packed a punch. Absolutely. We've sifted through, gosh, a mountain of sources, scientific journals, health organization reports, news from Reuters, AP News, you name it. Mm -hmm. And our job, like always, is to cut through all that noise and bring you the most essential, maybe the most thought-provoking insights from the past month. And we're not just listing headlines today. Our goal is to really connect the dots. We saw some major breakthroughs, but also, you know, some persistent challenges popped up again. Right. So we want to look at the policy, the research, the real world impact on communities. It's about understanding why these developments matter, not just what happened. What does it all mean in the bigger picture? OK, so let's jump right in. First up, some pretty major advancements in how we prevent and treat HIV. A big one landed on August 26th. Ah, yes, the European Commission approval. Exactly. Gilead Sciences injectable lenacapavir. It's going to be called Yetuo in Europe. Ah. Some of you might know it by its U.S. name, yes to go. And what's really groundbreaking here, I think, is the delivery method. This is PPP, pre-exposure prophylaxis. But injectable. Right, injectable, and get this, only twice a year. Twice a year, that's... That's huge. It really is. Compare that to taking a pill every single day. We're talking nearly 100% effectiveness with just two shots annually. So the potential impact on adherence, on just convenience? It's enormous. Yeah. Think about reducing that daily burden, potentially lessening stigma associated with daily medication. It could genuinely change lives by making pre-EP far more practical, especially maybe in settings where daily adherence is tough. And that approval covers the EU, Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein. So pretty wide reach to start. Yeah, it's a significant step for expanding global prevention options. Of course, reimbursement negotiations are still ongoing, which is always the next hurdle. Always. Which brings us kind of neatly to the flip side, right? Yeah. Access. Breakthroughs are amazing, but only if people can actually get them. It's exactly. And research highlighted late in August, August 29th, from UNC's Institute for Global Health and Infectious Diseases, really hammered this home. Mm-hmm. They pointed out that even with great science, those old barriers, stigma, cost, lack of awareness, they're still very much there. And not just in one place, right? They looked at both the U.S. and Africa. Yeah. These are widespread systemic issues. It underlines that, you know, scientific innovation is crucial, absolutely, but it's only half the battle. So what do we do? Well, the research suggests we need equally innovative public health strategies. Things like better education to fight stigma, improving insurance coverage, um, more community-based programs that meet people where they are, build trust. Because the best drug in the world doesn't help if it's sitting on a shelf. Precisely. Access is everything. Okay. And then there was another, maybe more unexpected finding related to treatment. Something about stress. Ah, yes. From the IAS 2025 conference, the International AIDS Society. It's still preliminary. But the findings suggest that acute psychological stress might actually change HIV viral activity. And this is even in people who are on effective RT, antiretroviral therapy, with suppressed viral loads. Wow. So does that mean stress makes the treatment stop working? Not necessarily, no. That's really important to clarify. It doesn't seem to cause treatment failure. But it does open up this fascinating area of research into, perhaps how stress affects those hidden viral reservoirs. The dormant virus. Exactly. The virus that hides out in the body. Does stress poke the bear, so to speak? It raises questions about holistic care. You know, maybe stress management needs to be a more integrated part of comprehensive HIV care than we currently think. That whole mind-body connection. It's really interesting. Okay, so uh -huh. from prevention and treatment complexities, let's pivot to the hunt for a cure. August brought some significant funding news. Always good to see investment there. First, Oregon Health and Science University, OHSU, landed an $8.4 million grant from the NIH. That's substantial. And it's specifically aimed at pushing their cure research forward. The goal, I believe, is potentially moving a clinical trial into gear within five years. Five years. That feels tangible. It does. It shows a real commitment to translating that complex lab science into something that could actually help people. Moving towards a functional cure. And they weren't the only ones. The Worcester Institute got an even bigger NIH grant. Right, $17 million, a huge amount. What are they focusing on with that? What's really interesting about the Wistar approach is that it's about developing individualized cure regimens. Not one size fits all. Exactly. They're planning to combine several advanced techniques, things like neutralizing antibodies, CRT cells. Those are the modified immune cells? Yeah. 
engineered to target HIV-infected cells. Plus, natural killer cells, NK cells, and these precision latency drugs designed to wake up that dormant virus. So the immune system or other drugs can then find it and clear it out. That's the idea. It's a multi-pronged attack tailored to the individual, really going after those viral reservoirs, which are the core challenge in achieving a cure. It's complex, but it represents a really sophisticated, personalized approach. Very hopeful. Okay, so we have innovation and prevention, treatment, cure research. Let's look at the policy side now and access challenges globally. It was a real mix in August. It often is, unfortunately. Let's start with something positive, Australia. The Australian Blood Service, Lifeblood. Ah, the plasma donation change, yes. They eliminated the mandatory waiting periods for plasma donors, and this specifically included gay and bisexual men who were on pre-P. Which is a fantastic step. It's policy catching up with science, recognizing pre-P's effectiveness, and also tackling historical stigma. Right. It addresses past inequities, but also helps boost the supply of vital plasma. It's a win-win, really. Reduces stigma, increases donations, all while maintaining safety. A really progressive move. But then turning to the U.S., concerning development in Ohio. Yes, the proposed Medicaid changes. That's causing a lot of worry. It could potentially jeopardize health care access for around 450,000 Ohio residents living with HIV AIDS. And that's huge. We're talking about access to essential, life-sustaining treatment. It really highlights how vulnerable healthcare access can be, even in developed countries. Continuity of care is just so critical. Absolutely. Stable, comprehensive support is vital. Policy shifts like this can create huge uncertainty and real health risks for people. Okay, let's look internationally again. There's a disparity issue in Latin America regarding breastfeeding guidelines. Mm -hmm. This is a tricky one. The science is pretty clear now. That mothers on effective RT have a very low risk, less than 1% of transmitting HIV through exclusive breastfeeding. Right. Countries like the U.S. and Canada have updated their guidelines to reflect that, supporting informed choice, but many Latin American nations haven't. So their guidelines still basically say don't breastfeed. Many still contraindicate it, yes, based on older data. And that puts mothers in a really difficult position. It creates ethical dilemmas, denies potential health benefits of breastfeeding for the infant, and adds unnecessary stigma. It's a clear case where policy needs to catch up with the evidence. Definitely. Now, shifting to South Africa, hmm. a really severe situation unfolded there. The U.S. aid cuts, yes, that's had devastating consequences. A $427 million cut led to the closure of 12 clinics. 12. Disrupting care for over 220,000 people with HIV, it's staggering. And hitting marginalized groups particularly hard, sex workers, transgender individuals. Exactly. Those often facing the most stigma and barriers already. Even though some aid was apparently restored later, the damage was done and access is still severely impacted. It's just a brutal reminder of how funding instability, decisions made far away, can have immediate life or death consequences on the ground. Absolutely. Global health initiatives are so interconnected and vulnerable populations suffer most when support is withdrawn. It unravels progress. And finally, on the global front, a really significant shift in how HIV is spreading in one part of India, Assam. Yes, the data coming out of Assam is striking. Injecting drug use is now reportedly driving the majority of new infections. It accounts for 65% of new cases. That's up from just 8.5% a few years ago. A massive jump. While heterosexual transmission seems to have decreased, this points to a rapidly changing epidemic locally. And there are still gaps in diagnosis and treatment, too. Big gaps. Around 12-13% of people living with HIV there are unaware of their status, and only about 70% of those diagnosed are actually on RT. So what does that shift mean for public health responses? It means they have to adapt quickly. You can't just focus on one transmission route anymore. It demands targeted harm reduction programs for people who inject drugs, better access to testing, linkage to care, and likely drug rehabilitation services too. It really shows how crucial understanding the specific local context is. One size does not fit all in HIV prevention. Okay, let's round things out with some other innovations. Maybe looking beyond just medicine. Vaccine news first. Yes, some hopeful, though early, news on the mRNA vaccine front reported August 1st. Building on the COVID vaccine tech. Exactly. An early stage trial looked at two mRNA-based HIV vaccine candidates, and the results showed they prompted strong immune responses. What kind of responses? Well, 80% of the participants produced antibodies against HIV proteins, which is encouraging. So a step forward, but still early days. 
Definitely. Much larger trials are needed to see if this actually prevents infection, but it's a positive signal, leveraging that powerful mRNA platform for HIV. It's a hopeful avenue. And finally, something a bit different. Combining activism and art. HIV Unwrapped. Yeah, this sounds fascinating. It's an event blending art, science, advocacy, using couture storytelling. Couture? Like fashion? Apparently so. It's oh. debuting during New York Fashion Week in oh. September. The idea is to use this kind of unexpected platform high fashion to promote HIV awareness. That's certainly a creative approach. It really is. It shows how people are finding new ways to reach different audiences, to keep the conversation going, reduce stigma, and embed HIV awareness into, well, into cultural events, moving beyond just traditional health campaigns. So looking back at August 2025. Right. Wow. What a month. It really feels like a snapshot of the whole global effort, doesn't it? It really does. You see these incredible scientific leaps forward that twice yearly pre-VP, the mRNA vaccine work, the sophisticated cure research. Pushing the boundaries. Absolutely. But then you also get these stark reminders of the hurdles that just won't go away easily. Yeah. The social barriers, the political challenges, the economic realities like access issues and aid cuts. It's never just about the science. Never. The science is vital. It gives us the tools. But achieving the ultimate goal is equitable access for everyone, comprehensive care, truly eliminating stigma that takes so much more. It's complex, it's multifaceted, and it requires constant effort on all fronts, from labs to legislatures to communities. So maybe the final thought for our listeners today. We've got these amazing scientific tools coming down the pipeline, like the twice yearly injection, potentially better vaccines. What actions beyond the research itself do we most need to focus on right now? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Yeah. What collective actions will actually ensure these breakthroughs reach everyone who needs them? How do we really make that final push to transform the global landscape of HIV prevention and care for good? Something to really think about.